Hello, I'm Nathan Furr from the Brigham Young University Marriott School of Management. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Today we are pleased to welcome Erica Wild, owner and operator of Wild Mats and Matting Incorporated, an online business specializing in entry mats, inlaid matting, garage flooring and other matting products since 1999. A graduate of Brigham Young University in Communications, Erica is a self-taught entrepreneur who loves the challenge of e-commerce. Wild Mats began as a small doormat cleaning and rental service, a literally dirty business. Erica sold the cleaning part of the business in 2003 to focus on e-commerce. Her online sales reached 700,000 last year. Erica and her husband Ryan are the parents of four children. The Rollins Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology welcomes Erica Wild to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> well, it's a real pleasure having you here and really valuable because you bring an a important perspective on Internet commerce. Uh, obviously, the Internet has become a fundamental way of doing business and a channel for doing business. and. You seem to have mastered that to some degree, so we're <laughs> grateful degree. to have you here. Um, what we'd like to do is, you know, first begin with, you know, a little bit hearing about your background and, and how you got in, into entrepreneurship, and then we could move from that into lessons you've learned about doing business online, and that would be wonderful. So tell us, how in the world did you get started in entrepreneurship? <laughs> And in the glamorous world of doormats for yes, that, the, right? Yeah, yeah business. dirty business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I probably went into entrepreneurship a little differently than most people. I, um, I was not a, a business major. In fact, my father is a business professor here at the Y. He just retired, Paul Tim, and he always pushed me to go into business, and I did not want to go into business. I was an English major, wanted oh, to do poetry yeah. and, and gaze at the stars and exciting things like that. Well, I... Uh, I, I don't know what changed, but I, I went to school for two years as, a, as an English major, went and served a mission in Canada, and when I returned, I, I felt like I wanted to do something a little more um, a, a little more productive with the English language than just read it. Yeah. And so I went into journalism, which is what I graduated in here from the Y. I toiled there at the Daily Universe a lot, and then um, went with my husband to Southern Utah, and I worked there while he went to school. And as soon as we were both done with school, we really had this, this passion that we wanted to start or, or buy or somehow have a business. And, and it came kind of out of nowhere because my husband graduated in communications also. And we had no particular training in business, but we just got this, this bee in our bonnet that we wanted to, to start a business. And I actually hooked up with some business brokers. And if, you, if you're not familiar with a business broker, they work just like a, a real estate broker would. That the people come to them who are selling their businesses, and then customers also come to them who are seeking to purchase a business, and they try to match up a good fit. And so I looked at, uh, my husband and I had a little bit of money saved up and, and just wanted to, to get into the business. We looked at a couple different things. We looked at a dry cleaner. That really scared us after we actually went and saw the equipment, and, and it was like a sweatshop in there, literally a sweatshop, the steam. And then <laughs> and we looked at a, a plant tending business where you would go to um, office buildings and water the plants and nurture them and give them love and help them grow. <laughs> and, and that was kind of interesting, too. I, we looked at a little kind of a UPS store type of a place, a little postage store in St. George. And I thought, I had one child at the time, and I thought, well, I could take my kids, you know, and throw them back in the packing peanuts, and we could just <laughs> live here and run this store. And, and they were all sort of appealing. But the one that our business broker showed us that was the most appealing was, strangely, a business I had never heard of. It was where you go to a, um, to a commercial office building, and you take away a dirty doormat that people have wiped, wiped their feet on all week, and leave a clean one. And then you drive away in the van with the dirty mat, and you take it to your giant washing machine, and you wash it, and you go back the next week and switch it out. A yeah. rental service. I didn't even know such a business existed, but you know, we, we looked at, at all the pros and cons, we, we prayed about it, and felt really good about this real small business. And so we actually bought a doormat rental service that was out of Salt Lake. We moved up there, um, grew the business, 
down to Utah Valley and I drove the big blue van, which we actually bought from BYU Surplus. It was beautiful. And um, laundered the mats in this giant washing machine that was so big, we could have both fit in the washing machine and you'd hang them to dry. And it was, it was literally a dirty business. Yeah. In fact, to this day, on rainy days, when I smell the smell of wet dirt, it just brings it all back. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh! I'm driving the van again. Erica, anyway, Erica, really quickly on that, how did you decide to buy that one versus the other ones? You know, we really got got scared off of a couple of them. Okay. For example, the dry cleaning business. Um, some of the others just, I, I, I felt like it had the most potential for growth. Okay. And it also gave us what we were looking for in a business. The whole point of being self-employed is that we wanted to have flexibility. I wanted to be able to be home with my with my little boy. I wanted to be able to work kind of when I wanted mm -hmm. to be my own boss and with this we could you know we, we ended up running this this route where we would go to Salt Lake one day a week Utah Valley one day a week and I would do that where we would pick up the dirty mats and the rest of the times it was really on our own timetable in terms of washing and yeah. and laundering the mats and yeah. so it really yeah. kind of gave us the benefits that we wanted yeah. and it was indeed a good choice for us we were able to grow it and and take take it to the next level which is kind of what we wanted yeah good so what was next so next, as we're, we're doing this dirty business of laundering doormats, um, I was coming across customers, and this is over a few years of time, I was coming across customers who didn't want our service. They didn't want to pay me $3 a week for the doormat because that's how we ran it was a subscription service where we would offer the doormat and the cleaning for a certain price. They didn't want to pay me the, the money. They just wanted to buy a really nice doormat for, for their front door. And that's a reasonable thing. Yeah. And with this business that we purchased came the distributorship or the rights to buy at wholesale um, these mats. And they aren't just a regular doormat like you would buy at Walmart or um, you know wherever. They were special doormats that you can launder in a washing machine and they come out and they have gripper backing, really industrial commercial doormats. And so I started buying through my distributor or through my manufacturer in Georgia where they're located at wholesale, I would buy some mats for some of my customers, mark them up and sell them. Mm -hmm. And then my father, like I mentioned, he's, a, he's always uh, been into business. This was about 1998 at this point, or excuse me, 99, when, um, you know, you guys were all pretty little, but this was when the internet, honestly, was really kind of getting going. It was about the dot-com bubble time, yeah. actually, it but was um, it was hot. And my father attended some kind of a hoopla hurrah thing where we're come to our conference and we're going to teach you how to make millions of dollars on the internet. And so he did because he's a business guy and is always looking for the next best thing. So he went to this conference and, and signed up for their service and had a, a website made for himself for just his consulting. And he said to me, they're going to build three websites. Do you want one of these? And it was literally as simple as that. And I kind of went, you know. Yeah, I would like one of those because then I can put the mats online and have the colors on there. And so we, I, I built this really quite awful looking website, but um, threw it out there, planning for it to be sort of a side help or a side assistance to my existing dirty business of laundering the mats and driving around. And I didn't really know anything about the internet, but I spent a lot of time reading and researching online and working at it the best I could. And I soon started to see some sales. I had really big traffic at first, like seven hits a day. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> but strangely, of those seven hits a day, I was getting people who would buy doormats from me about once or twice a week. And so I thought, wow, the people who are coming to my website are really a targeted um, customer mm -hmm. and they're ready to buy. So I, then I, I started paying a little more close attention to what was going on online and putting my focus more there. We eventually sold the, um, the rental side of the business so that I could focus straight on e-commerce. By this point, it was making as much money as the rental wow. company. And then we grew it from there. And that's been, it's been years now. I've been through a couple different hosts and a couple different um, websites. I sell now on four different websites online. Um, kind of depending on the niche of what I'm selling. I saw some really industrial type matting on one. And then stopdirt.com is my main website that's been around forever. That's where most of my sales come through. Wow. <clears throat> so you branched out into these different w niche websites. So how did you decide to do that? Well, I, I started with <coughs> just the one supplier of the doormats that, again, we, when we purchased that business, we got that distributorship to this one supplier in Georgia. 
And um, I first started, I first grew by just simply offering their entire line <coughs> because they sell more than just a doormat that you wipe your feet on at the door. They also sell matting products for standing on anti-fatigue mats. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. those? Anyone, you know, that feel nice and cushiony if you're standing at a counter? And, um, you know, outdoor mats, indoor mats, and, and just kind of branched out from there. And then I added other suppliers, which, which, by the way, is a whole other topic, but it was much easier to add more suppliers when I was already existing um, in, in business with one supplier. I was able to approach other suppliers and say, you have a product that, that my manufacturer here doesn't offer, and I'm having so much success over here selling these mats. I'd like to sell yours also. And usually it was a very simple process mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I was able to add them on. Um, and now I sell things like switchboard matting for if you're going to get electrocuted, you know, you stand on that so you don't get electrocuted. <laughs> Things like, um, you know, rubber matting that goes in a deep freeze that won't get brittle and you can walk into your freezer. Mm. All these things that I'm yeah. sure you don't even know exist. Yeah. <laughs> but it's big business. There is a really big, it's the dust and dirt removal industry. It's huge. I mean, there's wow. whole trade shows. It's, wow. it's trade shows, business. that's great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, as you were growing, you know, this business, I'm sure there were some bumps along the road, some bad surprises, some challenges. Do you want to? Sh would you be willing to share any of those challenges and kind of how you overcame them? Sure, sure. Um, probably the the thing that I did the worst at the beginning is that I was not real set on what my prices were. I had a certain price online, but you always get the customers who call and want to know what your deal is, and and I would try to. I don't know, I, I, I was kind of wishy-washy about yeah. where my prices were, which made a lot of work for me. I didn't have a set price line saying, oh, if you get a quantity discount at this rate or at this rate, which I now have. Yeah. So that wasted a lot of time and energy yeah. for me at first. And then, you know, I, I, I haven't had any, luckily I've not had any growing pains because I don't actually stock the product. Everything I sell is um, shipped and stocked by my suppliers. But I have had a couple of problems with suppliers. It's an awesome way to do business called drop shipping, where I don't have a warehouse and I don't have a house or a basement full of doormats. What I am selling essentially on the internet is a picture and a description only. And so once the product is purchased online, then I buy it from my supplier. They ship it directly to my customer. It's a wonderful way to do business and it allows me to do very high volume business at home. However, you lose a piece of control when you're doing that. And I learned that the hard way with a couple of my suppliers. I was selling a, a garage flooring product that um, from a company that, that I found out later, just they just weren't very organized and, and weren't really efficient. And I would take orders and I would be charging people's credit cards who had purchased this garage flooring from me online and then it would never ship. You know, and I'd get a call a couple weeks later from the customer saying, where's my stuff? And I'd have to call my supplier, where's their stuff? And, and, and problems like that that occurred or, or, or mistakes. And, and I, I quickly learned that, that if you're going to hand over that, um, that very important part of your business, the fulfillment of products, the sending of the products, you better make sure your supplier is going to be really reliable. That's great. Well, thanks so much for sharing, you know, your experience. My pleasure. Now, let's kind of abstract up a level, you know, for the students who are here today and those who are watching, how do you build an internet business where you're going to sell something online? Mm -hmm. How would, you know, somebody like me, I mean, I don't have any big ideas about what I could sell online. How would I get started doing mm -hmm. that? Good question. You know, and I get a lot of students, I do mentoring through the Center for Entrepreneurship, and I get a lot of students who say, I want to do what you do. I want to sell something from my home, and I, and I tell you, you can do it. Everyone can. The key is you need to find a product that you can get at wholesale. And I don't mean just something you can buy at Costco. Um, that's kind of wholesale. <clears throat> kind of not. But um, I, tell, I tell students, and, and my advice for you, is to look first at the contacts you may have. Do you know someone, be it a friend or a relative? Do you shop at a store that doesn't already sell their goods online? Do you know someone who's making something or has a patent or a specialty in something that you can sell online? I drive past, I live in Springville, and every, every couple of days I'm driving the old highway down to Spanish Fork to do shopping, and there's a, there's a I don't know what they sell there, but I always see this shop outside with all these um, weather vanes, big, metal, cool looking, you know, the flying cow over the moon, <laughs> weather vanes. And I, and I keep looking at that and thinking, I wonder if anyone's selling their weather vanes 
on the internet. You know, something as simple as that, if you, if you see a product somewhere that, that you have a connection to, that, that you can get at wholesale, that's mm -hmm. an awesome start. And there's, then there's research to be involved to see if you can be competitive. But that's where I would recommend starting, is looking at your own personal contacts. Mm. Okay, so find something you can buy at wholesale. Mm -hmm. What if you can't get it at wholesale? What if it's, you know, sometimes there are sites where, you know, it's not full price, but it's kind of halfway in between. Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? That's a good question. Another option for finding things to sell online is there are a lot of different internet wholesalers online. You can pay them a monthly fee or you can pay them a per price per product. It depends on the, on the internet wholesaler. There's a local company called Doba, spelled D-O-B-A. They're a reputable company. They um, run locally here out of Provo. And that is their job is to connect people who are manufacturing a product with people who want to sell the product. And there's going to be a markup in there for Doba. And there's going to be a markup. And if you can buy it online at wholesale, so can anyone else. So it's something to take into account as you're looking. But that is, a, that is one option, especially if maybe you have one or two products that you have access to at wholesale, but you want to make your store appear to be larger. You could fill it with some internet wholesale yeah. type items yeah. as you're growing. Yeah. How do you get started then? Let's say I did have a connection to something mm -hmm. wholesale. How would you recommend I get started? How do I put my toe in the water and launch this thing? That's a good question. Um, I think you, a lot of times you just need to do it. But before you do it, before you actually build online, there's some things that you need to look at about your product to make sure that it is going to be a profitable venture for you. Um, first of all, you do want to double check and make sure that the product that you are selling is indeed coming from the source. That's number one. We've just talked about that. You really don't want to resell something from a reseller because it's going to kill your profit margins best case, you want to get it as close to the source as possible. Either you make the product yourself, which is a whole other topic, or make sure it comes from the source. So that's the first thing is to make sure the product comes from the source. You want to look at your product and say, can I sell this online? Um, can this product be experienced online without me doing anything? Because the ultimate, the ultimate online business is a, is a business that will run itself Christmas, Easter, your mom's birthday, when you're at the birthday party blowing out the candles, your business is still home selling things for you. You want a product that through photograph and description alone can tell your customer everything he or she needs to know. That's ideal. Now I honestly think you can sell anything on the internet, but ideally if you want the product to run it, to, to sell itself and the business to run itself, Look for a product that will be experienced online through photos and descriptions only. You know, if the customer needs samples or if they need to talk to you on the phone or if they need to see the product in person, all of that is cost to you. And that's something you need to keep in mind as you're deciding what to sell. Those are big things. How about um, determining, I mean, one, you know, I could invest money building a website and advertising. Is there any way to know up front or get a guess if it'll even sell or not? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Good question. There's an awesome website online. It's called Google. <laughs> it's not just regular Google. But if you get into the Google AdWords, there is something called a keyword, a keyword analyzer. I yeah. think it's called on my keyword paper. Analyzer. On my on my. Um, I usually have the link. If you want to come at 3 o'clock, I'll give you the direct link. <laughs> or email me through stopchart.com. I'll send you the direct link. But if you just do a search on Google for keyword analyzer, there are tools online. Google has a, a wonderful free one where you can put in every name of the product that you can think of. If you're going to sell um, jeans, you would want to sit there and think of every possible name that people might call this. Blue jeans, acid wash jeans, if you're from the 80s like me. Um, you know, five pocket jeans. <laughs> you list your whole list of, of <clears throat> possible keywords and it's going to kick out the numbers to you of how many people each month on Google, which is a good indication of the whole internet, but how many people each month are searching for that keyword. If your numbers are really low, you need to ask yourself, um, is this still a product that's going to sell? Or, and is, is the niche market you know, if you can get the niche market, even if it's low, that's fine. But ideally, you want a, a keyword that's having a lot of searches. Yeah. So, you know, somebody like me, I, I go on, looks like the keywords are kind of good. Uh -huh. um, I have a contact. 
how do I launch it? How do I build the website? How do I get people to come to it? Well, how do you mm -hmm. how do you do that piece? That can be that could be a whole semester of a class, yes. let me tell you. <laughs> but the short version is there's a lot of a lot of cheap online ways to launch. The only thing is you just want to make sure I, I don't I don't recommend any one host over another. I I host with a company called Zuvi.com and they are wonderful but expensive. They weren't expensive when I started. That's why that's my only it's the only thing I have a hard time recommending sometimes to startup students is Zuvi because it is expensive. But you just want to find a host that can give you a secure checkout so that you can accept credit cards online securely and build your website. If you know someone who can build a website for you, great. If you want to build it with a template through Monster, fine, do that. If you want to build a Yahoo store, it's like $39 a month, build one of those. Even try selling on eBay. Some, some products are a great fit for eBay. Mm -hmm. Mine are not. My mats do not sell well on eBay, but I sell my mats on Amazon as well as my own websites, and they sell like gangbusters on Amazon. Okay. So it really just kind of depends on, on the market. Yeah. But I'd just say just do it. Yeah. Just build your site, <clears throat> and there's a whole bunch of, of search, search engine optimization <clears throat> rules that you can follow to build it, but that's too much to get yeah. into today. Too much search but, engine optimization. Uh, take, yeah. I'm sure there's an SEO class, Bill, I assume. Look, look online for an SEO class. Take, you know, do your research online, but right. just get it out there. Yeah. Here's another good question that I often wonder about. How do you think about customer acquisition costs. I have mm. uh, some friends who do internet commerce as well and, and one of them who's very you know successful uh, he says the thing I obsess about is customer acquisition costs. So what does that mean to you when I say customer acquisition costs and do you worry about it at all? Um, I did at first. I spent a lot of money well not a lot. I spent a lot I got a lot of my traffic at first through pay per click advertising. If you're familiar with that it's where you can select a keyword, in my case it would be something like doormats or more specific, one of my brand names like Waterhog doormat. And I would select a keyword and through the various pay-per-click systems, Google AdWords, Yahoo, um, Overture was big when I was starting, mm -hmm. um, I would pay a certain amount of money for everyone who clicked on my link to my website. In my case, it's not a really expensive um, business to be in the doormats and so I would pay usually between 10 and 15 cents to have someone click to come to my website. That can get costly in some industries. There are some keywords that are up in the dollar range that you're paying several dollars for a click to come to your website. But pay per click is a great way to get traffic when you're starting out if you can manage it in a low cost way and you can set that all up. The nice thing is you can follow through. The other thing is my the people I market for doormats, I, I'm happy to sell a doormat to a woman who wants it at her front kitchen. That's fine, but that's not my target customer. Who I like to target are the facility managers, the guys who run the big buildings, and they buy lots of big mats year after year. And I market through some, some magazines, some niche mm. ones like um, Warehousing Management Magazine, Facility Maintenance, Services Magazine. They're harder to track because it's hard to know who comes from the magazine to the website. But all the magazines now also have their web version, which is also easy to advertise in and easier to track. Mm. There's definitely costs involved in getting customers. But ideally, if you build your website right, um, you'll get free traffic from search engine optimization. You will come up on the search engines when people put it in. Yeah. And that's, that's the most beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> so to summarize, basically what you've told us is that it's actually very possible, not too late, no. to build a online business. Mm -hmm. But some of the keys to doing that are to find a, a wholesale relationship, mm -hmm. kind of a, basically a little bit of a unique resource in some ways, but a wholesale relationship, otherwise your margins are going to get eaten up. Right. Um, from there, you then, you know, you, you build a website, you begin marketing you could use uh, search terms you could focus on a niche I think mm -hmm. one thing you said is that you really you didn't try to sell to everything all over the place by focusing on a niche you were really able to kind of advertise in the most important places you know whole uh, what, what was it uh, like uh, Warehouse Where management or something, right, yeah, right. exciting magazines like warehouse yes. ma management, but no, but perfectly right on your niche uh, mm -hmm. that you want to be on, and then from there you just kind of kept building it and, and exploring and figuring it out. The drop shipping method is a very uh, useful technique for many people. You don't have to hold inventory. You don't Absolutely. have to handle. 
You don't have to deal with shipping, which is a pain. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still left with a couple questions. And that Shoot. is, Let's what see. if I go online and there's competitors? Oh, good question. There are always going to be competitors. Had we all gotten online in 1997, maybe we could have been the first. Yeah. I was one of the first online with my doormats, actually. I had some competitors, but they had some really lousy websites. But now I've got some competitors that sell the exact same product as I, as I do. Their prices are very similar to mine. They are, um, you know, in every way, a, a tough competitor. <laughs> yeah. Because you have a competitor online does not mean you can't be successful on the Internet. You just need to do something better. And it doesn't mean you have to have a better price necessarily. Maybe you can offer free shipping and your competitor can't. Maybe you can offer a website that looks nicer. Maybe you can offer a, a, a feeling on your, on your website that seems more professional or more trustworthy. Maybe you can offer a, secure, a more secure checkout. Um, or you can have better pictures where the customer can see the image better, mm -hmm. better feedback, you know, better you know, phone access, something. You need to do something that's going to, to be better than the competitor. You can't be better than everybody, but don't worry about competitors. Mm. There's always going to be somebody else selling it. But we're talking about the whole world here when you're talking about the Internet. There's a lot of customers to go around. As long as you can do something better. Now, that said... If your competitor is Walmart, <laughs> good luck. Yeah. You know, it, there's a few big, you know, really, if, you can, if, if you're looking to sell a product that anyone can buy at their neighborhood gas station for the same price or it's Walmart for less, you might want to move on to another product because there's a few people that are going to be really hard to beat. Yeah, that's a good point, and I've had that experience recently. I was buying a five-toggle light switch, kind of a unique thing. Oh, yeah. And... I bought it from the place that had a picture. There were draw places yeah. at drawings, and then there was one place that had a picture. And when I saw the picture, I said, that's mm -hmm. what I want. Mm -hmm. and, and I bought it. Well, we've all experienced that. When you're on the Internet, you go to some sites, and they just seem not quite right. You know, there's something kind of weird about it. At, or, or like you said, yeah. you can't see yeah. the picture really well. Yeah. There's no description. I'm surprised how many sites are out there like that, that they have a picture with very little description. You know, maybe that would be the way to, to differentiate yourself from your competitors. Just give them a lot of information. Yeah. Make your, set yourself up as the professional in that niche. Yeah. I'll tell you anything you want to know about five toggle light switches. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one last question. Do you have to be passionate about it? I mean, are mm. you passionate about dirt mats? <laughs> I am passionate about my business. I'm passionate about selling online and the challenge of coming up higher on the search engines and, and making the money and and offering a, a, a good product. But doormats, no. It's not like I go to sleep at night thinking, oh, the water hog with a, in evergreen with a rubber edge. You know, I don't, I, it's, not, it's not the product itself that you have to be passionate about. I think it would help, certainly. If you were selling a product that just made you want to sing a dance, sing a dance every day, that'd be great. But otherwise, then who would be selling, you know, office supplies and toilet paper and doormats? You know, I think you can, be, you can be passionate about being in business. It doesn't have to be your product. I encourage you to know your product really well. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, you don't have to be passionate about it. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Thank you so much. What I'd like to do is just see if the students have any questions sure. for you. What questions do you have for Erica? Please, go what ahead. What do you use for your content management system for managing all your products online? That's a good question. Um, through my host, Zuby, I have a built-in, you know, customer relations manager system that reminds me to send out my email newsletter and gives me the information about my customers, you know, when they buy, um, what they bought. There's, there's parts of it I would like more, but I'm not a big enough player now to be signing up with Overture. You know, I need to go to Orange Soda. Just learned about that today. <laughs> but I, use, I just use an in-house product. My, it's, it's just through my host. It's something they've built into their own software through Zuby. So it's not an outside piece. Can you offer any type of like return policy or warranty, like working through a supplier? That's a very good question. And that is going to be, um, she asked if I could offer a, um, a return policy or a warranty where we're working through a supplier, through the supplier is shipping. And that is a little tricky. My suppliers require a 15% um, a restocking fee they charge if you return something. I personally think that's bad service. I think people should be able to purchase and return um, if they don't like it.
for any reason. And so what I do with returns, how I handle it, is I do not have my customers return directly to my manufacturer. I have them return the products to me in Utah. I have one spot in my basement where we keep returns. Then I mark them down, sell them on clearance, and try to get them out the door, just try to make my money back out of them. I hate January. Right now I'm kind of up to my, well, it's finally, finally getting down. But you know, every January after Christmas, you get all the people who bought the mats and return them. Again, those customers I don't really like, the ones who are buying one mat for their house and then it didn't match their walls, you know, and I think, oh, go away. But, <laughs> but it, it's set up that, you know, I'm not going to turn away those customers. But that's how I handle the returns in most cases. I can ship things back to my manufacturer and I will if it is a large product that I can't resell or it's a real you know, something that I don't think is going to resell, I will. But then I have to eat that 15% restocking fee with some of my suppliers. How did you handle all the legal aspects of setting up your business? Um, I started out as an LLC, and that was by the recommendation of my accountant. I do have an accountant who, who does all my paperwork for me and my taxes. Um, later, we switched to, to become incorporated. We're a corporation now. And the, the legal aspects were pretty simple. It's a matter of getting signed up. You can do it on Utah. Dot, let's see, Utah.gov? No, business.utah.gov. Do a quick search. I'm forgetting the URL right off the top of my head. But you can do it all online. They have a one-stop business registration. You know, you pay them the 50 bucks. You're live and good to go. I think that it'd be smart to get some advice if you are starting out in terms of if you want to be a sole proprietor or an LLC or a corporation because there are tax advantages and disadvantages to each one. But there's a lot of people here at BYU who could, who could mentor you and give you some advice. Especially if you're going to seek out, you know, investment money. Sure. Then yeah. you really need to have some advice because there are some specific things that can happen there that could lead to long-term tax liabilities or make you less attractive. But but yeah, I think you're exactly right. Please go ahead. Uh, you mentioned some SEO uh, mm -hmm. in terms. Did you learn how to program and do that yourself, or did you outsource that? And if you did, who did you do it with? I did it myself. Now, now you got to remember that I put my my internet first, my first website online in 1998, and things were smaller and simpler then. I've never outsourced my SEO, but what I have done is I've hired through my host. Um, web designers who have done some things for me to make things look prettier. I don't know enough HTML. I can go in and change text, but I can't build a whole website. I built them through a template that was already pre-built with my host. Um, and and through, my, through the, the host that I'm with, a lot of the SEO is built into their system. For example, when I name a product, um, that product name becomes part of the URL automatically and the H3 tag automatically and the alt tag on my image automatically. All these kind of important things that help with SEO. But at the beginning, yes, I had to do that all myself. Yeah. On that, so SEO is search engine optimization. Yeah. For anybody who's uh, not sure about that. But I like what you said too that you learn to do it yourself. So mm -hmm. you don't have to necessarily learn to program, but you do want to kind of keep your costs low initially. So sure. other options you can use, for example, are like elance.com or freelancer.com. Mm -hmm. And we're entering kind of an era where you can connect as an individual with somebody overseas who's good at web design. Mm -hmm. And they can help you for a very low cost kind of develop a website. Or Absolutely. you can find some advice on search engine optimization or, or some help, some programming help if that's needed. And I think the real key there is to just kind of go out and look. Yeah, and to do it. There is so much free advice online and through the university here. You can get a lot of information on how to optimize your sites. And sure, if you paid a professional, they'd probably do a better job. But the bottom line is when you're starting up, if you want to bootstrap your business, meaning you don't want to spend any more money than you're making, you do what you can yourself, and and I personally like that because then I feel like I really own this business and I know how to work it. Because someday I may not want to sell doormats. I want to, I may want to do something else, and I want to take all my knowledge that I learned from this experience and take it with me into the next venture. Other questions. I have a question about drop shipping. Just kind of like the motivation for the manufacturer to not go into selling it themselves, kind of thing. Good question. Yeah. Not all, um, not everyone is willing to drop ship, and so you're right. There are going to be suppliers or manufacturers who who won't drop ship for you because they want you to to buy in bulk. 
They want you to take the risk of trying to guess what the customer is going to buy. But um, I think the motivation would be, it, I guess the motivation is just that they, can, that, that they have someone else selling their product for them. My suppliers, I only have one supplier that, that is a competitor to me that sells the product to the general public as well as to me. All the rest of my suppliers do not sell to the public. So if you want to buy my doormats, you have to buy it from a distributor. You cannot buy it directly from the manufacturer yourself. And I think they do that just so they can, so that the supplier can focus on the business of making their product. Because think if you were making some kind of a widget, to make the widget and to market it and sell it, those are almost like two different businesses. And it can get to be overwhelming. Where if you were making the widget and you had someone else who's willing to do all the work and, and headache of selling it, I guess that's the motivation. Just let them, let them do what, what they're good at. That's a good point. I mean, I think it's remarkably, it's surprising how remarkably difficult it can be for businesses to do many different types of activities. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that can be one of, you know, as you think about competition, that can be one of the barriers to competition. Often, you know, it's hard to do well. And so businesses will focus on one thing and you may think, well, if I move over here, then they'll just imitate me and take me out. For example, they'll just start selling their own products online. But usually even when they do that, it turns out to not be very well because mm -hmm. there are good old Adam Smith benefits to specialization. They Absolutely. Really are. Absolutely. So maybe we could do one last question. Um, kind of going back to your beginnings, when you first bought the business, what was the partnership like with your husband or what was the what were the different roles that you played? Good um, question. Kind of um, my husband and I kind of split it right down the middle when we were doing the, the dirty business. I drove the van, picked up the mats, he cleaned them, rolled them up, loaded them back in the van. And so we split it right down the middle, but there was Believe it or not, one point in time where we had the gigantic washing machine in our whole shop in our garage because we were renting this crappy house in Provo because we were poor and just starting out. So we're renting a crappy house and renting a crappy storage unit. And so we had both and, and we started running the numbers and said, you know, we need to just buy a house that has a really big garage. So we started shopping for that and did indeed move out to Springville. We've since moved. But um, when it was in the garage, that was hard because the business was right there all the time and we kind of he had his way of doing things you wouldn't think there'd be that many different ways to wash your doormat and roll it up but there is and you know it was tough my husband is not involved in the business at all anymore when we sold the rental side of the business he pr prior to 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 our success online he out of desperation had to take a real job <laughs> and he w he's a deputy sheriff at the at the county jail and he really enjoys it. It's a flexible schedule. So he does have a real job still. And I run the business now completely myself um, with one employee. And he's not really involved in, uh, at all anymore. So the moral is just beat down your, your partners and then you can take over. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Actually, it's true. <laughs> it's not an uncommon story, actually. Uh -huh. Partners, I mean, it's great to have partners. But you should plan for this. Often partners do just kind of you just kind yeah. of part ways eventually yeah. and and if it's your spouse and part ways on the business but right. not other ways it's so, better yeah. it's all good <laughs> um, well thank you so much Erica for coming in it was uh, really wonderful mm -hmm.